Okay. Okay, so uh, hello everyone, welcome back uh, to this session. So today we have uh, um, a standard proposal stock. Uh, and uh, so before that, let me remind you of the, uh, of the link that you have to remember uh, where you can find uh, you know, all the links that you need, uh, including links to the, um, to the PDF of the proposal and uh, also the, the notes. Um, so this also brings to the next question, which is that uh, we need a note taker volunteer. So if you, you know, if you want to volunteer for taking notes uh, on both the uh, presentation and especially on the discussion, um, please, uh, you know, propose yourself in the chat. Uh, so the format is, is going to be that uh, there is a presentation that is allocated uh, 30 minutes and then it's followed by 60 minutes discussion. Uh, and the discussion is going to be around both around the um, you know, the talk itself, but also about uh, the goals and the uh, milestone related to the standardization. So, and, uh, uh, you know, with that, I'm going to introduce the, um, the talk, uh, which is on, uh, um, on Plumo, uh, towards scalable interoperable blockchains using ultralight validation systems. So the uh, talk has two speakers, uh, Michael Straka and uh, Psy Vesely. Um, so Michael uh, has, um, uh, works on cryptography at C-Labs and he works, also works on the Cello blockchain. And his current work includes applied zero knowledge and embedded development. Uh, Psy Vesely instead is a cryptographer working primarily on zero knowledge proofs as a researcher at uh, C-Labs and UC Berkeley. And uh, with that, I leave the floor to, uh, to Michael that I guess is going to start first. Cool. Thanks for the intro, Daria. Uh, so now you go. can share your screen. Yes. Uh, let me know if you can see the slides. Yes. Cool, looks good. But, well, thanks for your time. Uh, we're going to be talking about our Lit client for the solo blockchain called Plumo, uh, which in particular is snark based. Uh, let's dive in. So, in particular, what I think we want to have on the back of our minds as we discuss this is. Uh, you know, we started working on this a year ago and uh, run into some like, reasonably unique challenges. Uh, so there's kind of an interesting question of what might it have been useful to have standardized back when we started working on this, right? Something that we could just kind of pick up and use. Uh, in particular, we have some uh, cryptographic building blocks we've used that we think are of independent interest and also uh, more of a formal model for light clients in general. Uh, in particular applications where you're updating some st state with snark proofs. Uh, so what, what is the problem? Well, the problem in our case is that blockchains are big. How big? very big. You can see here that Bitcoin is hundreds of gigabytes. This is fine if you just blew 10K on a mining rig, not so fine if you're using a smartphone. So how can we make it easier to verify that the state of the network and that different transactions are actually okay? Uh, so one approach is just to use the SPV assumption, which is just in the proof of work case, you just verify that block hashes on the chain sort of work out correctly and you only verify individual transactions instead of verifying that the entire chain is correct. Uh, so you can do this using Merkle proofs for individual transactions. This makes things a lot more efficient, but you're also relying on full nodes to verify the full state of the chain, which, you know, that seems reasonable, but it is an extra assumption that someone else is going to catch sort of uh, mistakes if they happen. 
and some other related work. Uh, in particular, there's been some interesting work with Nipopow and FlyClient that use sort of statistical properties of the block caches in proof of work to uh, you know, more allow you to more efficiently verify the, the change state. But these solutions only really work for proof of work. Uh, we use proof of stake, so it doesn't work for our setting. Uh, they might actually, I think fly client might work in some cases with proof of stake, but not, not generally. And of course there's Coda, which uh, you know, they've designed a blockchain that can be the entire chain, including things like validator elections and uh, just the consensus protocol can be verified in a single snark proof using proof recursion. Uh, you know, they just recursively compose proofs to ensure that you only have one proof to verify at any moment. And obviously this is ideal for the end user. You can't really get better than that, uh, especially if you're using succinct proofs like you would get with uh, something like GROS 16. Uh, but you, you sort of need to do a lot of work to ensure that things like your consensus algorithm is snark friendly. And it's also harder to get additional functionality like smart contracts that uh, who we also wanted to have. The addition we can sort of get around a lot of that by using a variant of the SPV assumption for proof of stake. So that's what we've chosen to do. So give some more detail about our setting. We use a proof of stake consensus algorithm. Uh, in particular, at any moment, we have 100 validators that are elected. They're, you know, people vote on them with their stake C gold, and the ones with the most votes get elected. And in particular, a block is going to be valid a block containing transactions is valid if over two thirds of validators sign off on it. Now, how do we do uh, signatures? Well, we use BLS signatures because they can be easily aggregated. Uh, so if you apply the same function to a bunch of signatures and a bunch of public keys, then you get another valid signature public key pair. So you can just add the signatures together because they're looked at curve points and do the same with the public keys. And then you can verify the aggregate multi-signature that way. Uh, in particular, the signatures here are one per validator and you know, so are the public keys. And uh, every day we have an epoch block which contains the public keys of uh, the, the new public keys of new validators and then the indices of the validators that they replace. So at any moment, you can iterate through all the epoch blocks, reconstruct the current validator set and verify that, uh, you know, the signatures are okay. And then each set also has to sign off on the next validator set. So you sort of naively, you can just iterate through these and verify them manually, but the chain is, becomes very long, uh, say a year or two, that could be a bit expensive, especially if the device you're using is uh, a bit slower. So one way you can make this even more efficient is to just do what I just described inside of a snark proof. So looking a bit more closely at BLS verification, Ah, yeah, this is the verification equation. Sigma on the left is the signature. M is the message. And uh, so basically you, if you're signing, you just uh, hash the message and raise it to the power of uh, X. And you know, by the bilinearity of pairings, this equation should work out. But of course, there's a problem here, which is that 
if you're doing elliptic curve computations inside of an arithmetic circuit, that's that can be a problem because you, you know, the computations are going to reduce down to the base field of the elliptic curve, uh, but you actually want the circuit to be defined over the scalar field of your curve, which is the size of the curve itself. So what you really want is a, uh, it's called a two chain of curves, where both the base field and the scalar field of the original curve have high truidicity. So you can do a sort of fast Fourier transform based snarks like Roth 16 in both curves, right? Because in our setting, we use a pairing friendly or a pairing based snark, which requires the, uh, you know, the second curve, the outer curve here to be here SW6 to be pairing friendly. But then we also need the original curve to be pairing friendly because we use pairing based signatures. Right, so uh, that constrains your traces a bit, but fortunately, the uh, people working on Zexi have found a uh, curve, uh, BLS12377, with these properties. And in addition, a, a, another outer curve, SW6, using the Cox pinch method, uh, which is what we currently use, but a recent paper by Husni and Giovic uh, found an even better curve on top of 377 that has faster pairings, faster scalar multiplication, smaller group sizes. Uh, in, in particular with uh, BLS signatures, if you're using asymmetric pairings, then you basically have public keys in one group and then private keys and signatures in the other group. Uh, in our case, we chose uh, G1 for signatures for uh, faster signing. Uh, so BW6 here seems pretty strictly better. We're, it's something we're looking at pretty heavily. Uh, so we also designed a there's one, one way to doing a hashing in BLS signatures in a circuit safely is just to use some of the newer sort of uh, you know, R1CS flavored or algebraic flavored hash functions. Uh, but they're still fairly recent. So we chose to be a bit more conservative and design what we call a hybrid hash function where you basically take the, uh, so the, the end result is an application of Blake 2x, or just sort of a normal symmetric hash function, but that's going to be expensive in a circuit because it uses a lot of bit ops. Uh, but we, so first to make the input to this smaller, so it uses less constraints, we put our input through uh, the Bau Hopwood Peterson hash. And uh, after we get sort of a compressed input to that, we put that result into Blake 2x. And we need the Blake 2x because we need the result to be random or else you can forge signatures. Uh, and in particular, we do this using try and increment. You just increment a nonce and try over and over again until you get a result that, uh, you know, that's actually a curve point. Uh, so are there, you know, one issue you might have with this is that it's not constant time. Are there other options you could use, uh, sort of? Uh, one issue with 377 is that the base field prime is congruent to one mod four. So there doesn't seem to be any really great solutions for constant time square roots, which are necessary for, uh, at least all the hashing methods that I'm aware of. So it's very difficult to make this constant time. This is fine in our case because we don't need our messages that we're signing to be secret. So if someone does a timing attack there, they're not really, they're not learning anything. But maybe in some applications, this is important. Um, and then uh, the paper by 
I think Riyad Wabi recently. There's also some, some optimizations they developed for 381 or for hashing in constant time are also harder to apply in this case because P is congruent to one mod four and not three mod four. Uh, so that's sort of an overview of the different primitives that we use uh, in our circuit. So now we can hand things off to Sai and he can sort of give an overview of the more uh, higher level design choices that we've made. So you're muted in case you're Okay. Uh, everyone can uh, see my screen. Uh, I think you're good. Yes. Okay, lovely. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> continuing off, um, we're going to talk about uh, scaling now from the Kruger side. Um, so uh, we still have this problem that like, uh, you know, our verifier is ultimately going to get snarks uh, and those will be, you know, cheap to verify. Um, so in some sense, we kind of, Michael showed how we, we would figure that out. Um, but there's still the question from the prover side of um, how do you prove a whole bunch of authenticated data? Um, as say uh, you know your chain grows, your number of validators grows, uh, something the amount of authenticated data specific to your chain grows over time and use with the number of users. Um, so a uh, general solution to that uh, is like incremental proofs or incremental verification, um, which there's uh, a number of techniques for. Um, the first one that's uh, pretty well known uh, is from uh, BCTV14. Uh, the paper is called on cycles of elliptic curves, I think, um, or scalable zero knowledge through cycles of elliptic curves. Uh, anyway, it introduces this notion of uh, just re using recursive proof composition, um, where you have this, uh, you have some initial proof pi zero uh, attesting to uh, x zero being this initial state and w zero being uh, the blockchain data. For us, this is like a multi-signature over uh, epoch messages. Um, so uh, essentially for, for our ultra light client, our, the state it needs to have is the current uh, committee of validators so that it can uh, you know, verify blocks uh, for for the current time period, so it can check transactions and whatnot and check the multi-signatures that the validators will make. So it needs to know like who's correct for that. So you have this kind of chain of uh, handoffs between them. And um, in each of these, you would uh, like each of, when you have a whole chain of like handoff epoch messages, you'd say like validate one, and then you'd have a, or some number of them at a time. And then you'd have a proof of that. And then your next proof would uh, verify the last proof and then like the next, uh, whatever, 100 epoch messages or however, uh, many kind of at a time in addition to verifying the last proof, the prover can do. Um, and this makes it possible to prove, uh, a lot of data and also you don't have to redo, uh, work in a sense where you're not having to, uh, uh, going back to, to here, um, 
you're not having to like create a proof here and then one here and you don't have to prove essentially the whole data over again uh, in order to make a single snark uh whoops sorry <laughs> uh Uh, so anyway, um, going back to this, um, there's, uh, so we get a truly succinct sort of ultralight client system for bootstrapping it, where even if the network's been running for a while and has a ton of authenticated data, we want this user experience to be sort of instant. So all they would get is this, uh, pi n. Um, at the end, um, <clears throat> in, uh, and so like, no matter how far along you are, you sort of always have, uh, the ultralight client verifier being able to just verify a single proof to get up to speed and be able to start interacting with the network and doing things, uh, they actually want to do transactions or whatever sort of, uh, functionality um your system provides um and uh proving the verifier circuit is generally pretty cheap for these so it's not like a huge overhead to have to prove that pi zero is correct uh in in pi one um what is inefficient is that uh finding cycles of pairing friendly elliptic curves which we would need because of to, to do this with a, a pairing based snark, which um, most if, like most snarks are pairing based, almost all of them, um, is that uh, these cycles are all, uh, there are no efficient cycles known. So uh, the curves that we use for pairing based cryptography in general are a little bit under 400 bits, whereas um, the known cycles are closer to 800. So there's a big performance hit uh, for both the prover and the verifier um, and everything. But like uh, even worse than that, um, DLS has to be done over these curves. So not just the ultralight client protocol aspect is affected, but the whole protocol. So our full nodes in general don't work over uh, in our system, don't work over our outer bigger curve. They all work over the inner curve. Um, and that allows us to get like sort of normal efficiency for BLS. Uh, otherwise, we'd have to take this sort of big performance hit. Uh, our solution uh, then instead of um, doing recursive composition is uh, just much more simple and straightforward, which is uh, just to kind of prove adjacent uh, chunks of the chain at a time in uh, incremental proofs. And so um, in some sense, you have to you have to verify pi zero and pi one and so on. And so like during bootstrapping, uh, you might have to verify like more than one Stark. And uh, strictly speaking, there's not a, um, there's not like full succinctness on the verifier that is, it would be nice, of course, to say, like in an asymptotic sense, that no matter how many validators are in the network or how long it's been running or how many blocks have been produced uh, or how many transactions, that um, an ultralight client can always like just download a single proof of like a fixed size uh, and then be instantly bootstrapped. But um, we realized that uh, because of the sort of SPV like assumption that we make, which is basically that, uh, you know, the validators, the committees have been honest and handed off uh, um, state to the next ones. And we're not having, a, or we're not having them check all the individual blocks and block headers. We're just having them check the epoch transition messages. That's kind of like our SPV assumption combined with the fact we're using uh, like multi-signatures and aggregate multi-signatures of BLS and uh, just doing as much as we can to make things uh, take up as few constraints as possible. We're able to prove like easily a year uh, sort of at a time in one of these uh, proofs. And so while we're not getting this um, like asymptotically succinctness, we're getting uh, in practical terms, uh, 
succinctness really where where like you know doesn't really matter it's not it's still an instant from user experience sort of sort of to get to verify like multiple cross 16 proofs um it really doesn't take that much time even on slow devices um so as long as you're able to uh prove like a really large chunk of data um then this method uh works uh like you know a, a large chunk of time sort of that you suspect for your network at once um and it's better um one of our, our big one of our big benefits is that specifically that almost everything happens uh on our network over vls12 uh 377 so we have an actually efficient uh pairing friendly curve to work over for most of the system cryptography that's what the validators do everything over and it's just the sort of ultralight client system which is not uh part of the consensus that uh that deals even with uh the second curve that is inefficient the outer curve the cox pinch sw6 curve um so just to talk about uh the circuit a little bit more um so what we're trying to prove per epoch basically like our sort of spv assumption that i talked about is uh spv like assumption uh it's just that we have this chain of epoch messages where uh like each committee uh signs off on like the next committee of validators public keys um they do this once a day um they kind of do this handover and it's according to the proof of stake mechanism where people vote on the next validators and then, you know, the current validators being honest, respect that, or so we assume. Um, so anyway, per epoch message in our chain, um, we check that the aggregate public key was formed by adding at least two thirds of the current committee's public keys according to the bitmap. Um, so each uh, signature uh, when you have a multi-signature, you have a bunch of people in the current committee, uh, the signature is accompanied by like uh, a um, bitmap showing like which people signed it. So you know how to create the aggregate public key that will work for the multi-signature in BLS. Uh, and then uh, you check that the current epoch message number is one greater than last, pretty straightforward. And then you check that the uh, multi-signature is valid with respect to the message and the aggregate public key. Um, so we can get uh, a constant um, improvement on the number of constraints and pairings that we need to do by uh, combining when we have multiple epochs, uh, you can take uh, multiple DLS multi-signatures and combine them into an aggregate DLS multi-signature. And uh, this cuts the amount of pairings in half that are required to be computed, um, like per epoch, when we're able to verify multiple at once. Uh, so we basically compute the aggregate public keys the same, um, according to the bitmaps, to check the epoch messages are one greater than the last. And then uh, instead of checking each multi-signature per epoch, we just check them all together, uh, or sorry, checking each multi-signature, we check a single aggregate multi-signature uh, at the end. Um, and that, you know, almost halves the uh, constraints we have for this. And so, of course, this allows us to prove uh, greater uh, spans of, of time, uh, which is important to us because the ability to prove like a year at once uh, means means that um, our clients going to have the experience that we want them to have, which is kind of like instantly getting uh, bootstrapped up to the current state of the chain, no matter how much uh, it's grown. Uh, so uh, looking at some performance results for proving. Um, so we're seeing uh, like nice uh, linear relationships and the number of uh, epochs and uh, validators, um, which keeps, which like as is expected, our system is uh, pretty scalable um, and, you know, actually will hit problems with uh, other parts of the system scaling first, such as the uh, uh, BFT 
and whatnot at, for validators and whatnot, but essentially uh, uh, the way that it works as, as now, we're not sort of uh, the, the scalability like bottleneck on, on validators. Um, uh, and so we kind of, you know, can have however many validators and epochs and still have uh, the properties we want. Um, uh, also for memory, uh, we see this. Um, so seems like a lot of memory to have whatever, you know, uh, 250 epochs, that's still less than a year and uh, hundred validators. And, you know, we're at over 800, but actually this is not too expensive. It turns out, uh, in terms of like you rent a super powerful machine with like terabytes of Ram on Google cloud and you run it for 20 or 30 minutes to prove like a whole year and costs like 15 or $20, something very cheap. So it's very practical to uh, do this. Um, and again, here's uh, constraints, all uh, linear relationships. Um, and so here's some uh, concrete results on uh, how long it takes to get bootstrapped uh, on various systems. Um, uh, so, you know, all like within a few seconds, um, Moto G2 is quite old and takes six, but still not terrible since this is a sort of like one time, um, setup cost or bootstrapping costs for the ultralight client. Um, and here is the uh, estimated gas cost of a bridge transaction between Celo and Ethereum. Um, again, it's like, you know, important that uh, our proofs are pretty efficient here uh, in order to just make this, uh, you know, not super costly. Um, anyway, we're going to turn it over to uh, the discussion section. Um, so thanks everyone for your time. And uh, looking forward to uh, your questions and everything. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, sorry, just to add on to that, something uh, both of us forgot to mention is that this is also a joint work with the two of us and Ariel Gabazin, Kobe Gherkin, Philip Yovanovic, Georgios Konstantopoulos, Asa Owens, Merrick Golshevsky, Aaron Schromer, uh, and, and us. So, just wanted to give the shout out. Yes, thanks. Uh, so now it's time for questions. So. Mm. Okay, first of all, um, maybe if we want to collect questions about the talk, uh, and then we can move to more specific discussion points around the proposal. Are there any questions on the talk? And please, like, okay, yeah, also I want to remind um, if someone wants to volunteer to take notes, uh, perhaps someone that didn't do it uh, yet. It's very important, like so that you know, having notes will help uh, in the standardization process. I think someone is taking notes. I don't know who it is. Oh, okay. oh Abida, that maybe. Is, oh, yeah. okay. great, great, great. Thank you. great. Thank you very much. So I had a very short question. Do do we need zero knowledge property of uh, zk snarks in this setting? I see that you are using this succinctness because you want to have succinct verification, but is it important to have zero knowledge as well? No. Okay. Uh, in fact, we uh, removed it um, because it gives us a big prover uh, speed up. Okay. Mm -hmm. For Gross 16. So basically, if you don't need it, so is it allowed to use designated verifier systems as well? because we don't need zero knowledge. So basically we can allow verifier to generate the parameters, yes? 
to use the what systems? And this uh, ZK snarks that allow designated verifier, not publicly verifiable. In this case, we do need public verification because this will be verified by every light client um, and uh, we want a uh, single proof to be associated with the chain that will serve everyone. Okay, so, so uh, I mean, if we have a small blockchain in companies, but we, we can still use this, for example, to have a, I would say that the reason that what I asked is that, for example, currently we have this lattice based ZK snarks that are based on designated verifier. So if we don't need this zero knowledge and uh, if, if it is possible in some cases, we can move to lattice space. But yeah, as you mentioned, for blockchain setting, we need this public verifiability. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you said that uh, there was a performance advantage from um, removing ZK from Grot16. Do, do you have any numbers on um, how much of an advantage that gives? Not off the top of my head, um, but uh, we could we could probably link that somewhere. Um, Thanks. There's yeah. Is there maybe in the the like discussion board? We'll do that on the website on the forum. Cool. Yeah. So there is also a question from the chat. Uh, so it's a question from Madi who is asking like, how does this construction, how is con the construction comparable with existing schemes like Fly Client and Night Solutions? So, so comparable in terms of efficiency. Uh, so, I'm not entirely sure how it compares with Fly Client, uh, since we didn't really do a direct comparison, since it doesn't work with our setting. Uh, I know for the uh, sort of naive, you know, not naive, but you know, basic solution of just checking each epoch block manually and verifying the signatures. Uh, we did calculate how many, you know, how many blocks you need to verify manually for it to be equivalent to a snark proof. And I believe that was something like, I think something like 10 epoch blocks. So, uh, it ends up in our case being equivalent to about 10 days. It's like the threshold at which verifying a snark proof is more efficient. Thanks. So there is another uh, question. It's about scalability. So how does, uh, so this is by Alice, Alice there. And um, the question is, how does this scale to 1000 validators or 16,000 validators? Do you have any numbers? Uh, actually, so our original graphs for actually, context here, um, like sixteen thousand is is how many Ethereum are me measuring for their test net, right? So sixteen thousand, uh, something ridiculous like that, yeah. And could be looking at one thousand. We'd love to use this, but uh, I don't know if it's fast enough. Yeah. So I think uh, our original graphs for benchmarks we did test uh, a, no, sorry, I'm thinking of epochs. Uh, I don't think we've tested it with a thousand validators, but I mean, my expectation is that you could still do a reasonable number of epochs. Maybe I would say at least a month probably with a sort of similar machines. Uh, but it's not immediately clear to me how much you could prove with a. Uh, so, and that would be in our case, you would just, uh, well, actually, I see you would just be increasing the cost of the Peterson hash, uh, the Bo Hopwood hash, which is about 1.6 constraints per bit. So I think this would be pretty like reasonably easy to calculate. 
Uh, so yeah, it's going to grow linearly. Um, we're with 16,000, we um, might not be able to prove the amount of time um, that we want to. Like we might, uh, our prover might be not able to prove a year, for example, if uh, there were 16,000 and that cost, uh, as Michael was saying, is mostly going to come from uh, hashing. Of course, uh, the multi-signature will still, like per epoch, will still take the same amount of time to verify and will we also do it as an aggregate multi-signature. Um, so instead it's going to be uh, um, needing to like hash and unhash those. Uh, specifically we we uh, use the trick to make verification of uh, GRAS 16 snarks faster where normally there's a uh, so the instance is field elements and there's one exponentiation per field element uh, in the gross 16 verification equation, field element in the instance. So instead of having the raw instance, which would be all the public keys, um, we hash them and then we kind of prove knowledge of uh, like a pre-image of that hash inside the circuit such that this pre-image uh, satisfies uh, our original circuit. Um, uh, and then we have, we have, we send the ultralight client, the verifier, the actual public keys, um, and we have them first like hash it and then uh, check the uh, GRAS 16 verification equation using that hash, like using a hash to field, using those field elements, uh, like two field elements as an instance instead of like the many field elements you'd have to pack 100 or 16,000 um, public keys into. Uh, so that's what becomes uh, expensive there is that the prover has to uh, use all these extra constraints um, and specifically Blake 2x is what we use to uh, unpack that because asking the verifier to uh, hash things with outside of or hash at all, you know, using the uh, Blake Hopwood Pedersen hash would be like inefficient and it would versus, you know, uh, which is what we're trying to avoid um, when so you by, by using this technique in the first place. Uh, so I, I think, uh, sorry, I, uh, that uh, right now it's not where we want it to be, but uh, our thought was that if we can, it, increase the number of validators, which would mean changes to BFT, um, to our consensus algorithm, then we might look at something uh, like uh, SIP, which is a protocol for uh, like outsourcing VLS verification that could be used inside a circuit um, uh, that I introduced with some other authors uh, in, in a paper recently. Um, but without doing like more than depth one recursion, there's not like a whole lot of uh, techniques that I know of besides that to uh, be able to prove larger periods of time. Right, right. So, so one thing on that. So the first thing is, so you expect the verifier to have all the public keys? Uh, um, that's that's what we're doing uh, currently is ultralight client gets all the keys. If, I think things would change. Uh, you wouldn't want them to have to store all 1600 keys. Instead, I would imagine that you'd want a commitment to uh, the validator keys, and then you would want to be able to, uh, you would do something like, instead of having a bit mask uh, do it, you'd want to have some sort of proof of like, here, this aggregate public key is uh, at least a two thirds majority of all the keys that are in this commitment. Um, I don't think it would be that hard to find a uh, way to prove that pretty efficiently. Like, I don't know, Oracle trees, of course, come to mind, but there's probably a better way. Um, right, right, yeah. So okay. I, I, as I said, I was uh, looking at your, at your tip thing for that, but I don't know if it works or if it's faster. Um, so um, let's, what, yeah, Daira, go, go ahead. And then there is one more question from the chat. Um, what properties are you relying on Blake 2 for? 
So we need blade. So Peter, uh, the Bao Hapodash is collision resistant, but that's not sufficient because uh, a forger could still create like a, a linear combination of yep. uh, you know group points to forge a signature. So we use Blake 2x for basically random looking output. It, uh, yeah, it's uh, to instantiate the random oracle that uh, BLS calls for. And I guess the, I, 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 guess I had the actually a related question to that. Sorry, uh, what? So uh, I wanted to ask this question. It's like, you know, that uh, you use the random oracle to sample the generators, but the hashing is still has some homomorphic properties. So, and I wonder if this is like secure. What hashing has homomorphic properties? The Pedersen and hash. Uh, yes, it does, it does but then but the res is sufficient. collision resistance is not sufficient for, uh, for what the you're using. BLS hash to group. Uh, but like if you, if you pass a message through a collision resistant hash function and then through one that is supposed to be a random oracle, kind of the composite of that is a random oracle. But are you passing the message to the random oracle or not? Yeah, so the hash function that we use, so for for normal blocks, um, you were just using Blake uh, for the, the BLS multi-signature that gets made on each normal block. But for the epoch messages, uh, where we want to have a more like uh, snark friendly uh, hash to group function, we created a composite hash function where we first um, shrink down the message by using a collision resistant compression function, in this case, the Bohopwood Pedersen hash. Um, and that's like basically constraint friendly. And then we get a uh, you know, sort of like collision resistant hash from that, which is small. And then we only have to run like uh, one or two iterations of the uh, internal compression function inside Blake 2S. Uh, and so that means that uh, having to only invoke Blake 2S saves us a lot because Blake 2S is uh, really expensive. It's a cost estimate. It's, it's yeah. about 22,000 per, per uh, 512 bits is the uh, like input block size. Mm -hmm. So there was one more question uh, by Youssef. Youssef, do you want to ask directly? If you hear uh, us. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I was with uh, So yeah, my, my question was basically, are you planning to, to move it to, to replace the SW6 curve by the BW6 curve for more efficiency? Uh, yeah, that's something we're looking at doing right now. Um, and really the only reason for not doing it is because the, you know, it's newer, so there are fewer and less audited implementations. But yeah, that's definitely something that we want to do. I got you. Uh, okay. Um, so I think we can now move uh, for the next half an hour to discuss more like the uh, you know, points around the standardization. So we, we listed um, some points in the, in the notes that you can find in the, in the links webpage. So, right, the first, let's say, topic is, um, is related to what or can be standardized in the context of uh, in the scope of zero knowledge proofs from your proposal. And, you know, yeah. Do you want to say something about it? Um, uh, yeah. So something that I think would be really interesting, um, something that would have helped us while we were working on this, is some sort of standard or uh, standard for verifying signatures inside of uh, 
you know, R1CS snarks. So, and that's also kind of, I think a bit of a nuanced question because in our case where we're doing both sort of pairing based signatures and pairing based verification and pairing based snarks, we need a, a curve like 377 where both the base field and the, the scalar field have high to -adicity. So, you know, it's also not clear that this is going to be the case if, say, you're using uh, something like Halo, which doesn't require pairings. So, I mean, you can, you can still use Coxfinch with Halo, so you can still do, um, you can still verify pairings. Would that be, uh, would, oh, okay. But you wouldn't need uh, the like the original. So you can use either the half pairing variant of Halo. Um, uh, for example, Coder are using a, a Halo Marlin hybrid now um, that they call Pickles. Um, or you can use original Halo and then construct a um, a right. So yeah. you wouldn't need uh, the outer curve to be pairing friendly, right? So you wouldn't need the base field of the original curve to have high to adicity. So it seems like you could just use Cox pinch over 381 in that case. Um, This would also give you a prime in the base field that's congruent to three mod four, which makes uh, constant times square roots and uh, it's signing easier. Yes. I'm actually working at the moment on a way to um, construct a, a halo-like cycle um, with a pairing friendly curve on top of it that with a row value less than two. Um, I don't quite know whether that's possible yet. It seems it's it's not ruled out by anything that I can see, but uh, it seems quite hard. So if, if anyone has um, ideas on how to do that, then contact me. I need a question also for uh, you know for the audience, uh, like whether you do find it interesting to, for example, considering the standardization of verification of signatures or signatures that are, let's say, friendly uh, um, in the context of verification inside SNARKs. So, uh, do yeah. you mean um, pairing based signatures or um, discrete log based signatures? Uh, oh, I didn't mean <laughs> any of the two. Like, I mean, um, I think like uh, this is a question, right? So, um, I mean, personally, I think DLS signatures have interesting properties, but maybe some other signature scheme could make sense as well. So, so the um, the work we're doing on um, a scalable Zcash will need um, discrete log base signatures in the snark. And by discrete log base, you mean like uh, not red like? Oh, or red DSI. Okay. Which is basically Schnorr. All right. Okay, and uh, you also had a, a point about uh, ash, the ash to curve technique that you use. Um, so, do you see like uh, right? Then the, the, right, the, the, there is another question: is whether uh, both in the context of this ash to curve and in the context of signatures, do you see more applications of this beyond what you you know you showed today in the talk? Because this is very important in the context of uh, of standardizations that like the application should not be very narrow, but uh, you know the more applications, the more there is interest in standardizing. Yeah. So the place where you would want to use the hybrid hash function that we've designed is uh, really just 
any of the cases where you would want to use some of the more sort of algebraic flavored hashes like uh, Poseidon or Mimsy, but where you're willing to accept sort of a higher constraint cost in favor of a more sort of conservative approach in terms of security. So you know, assuming these hash functions are around like 10 years from now, I, you know, I think you would want to use those instead. But in the short term, I, I think the hash that we've designed would be a, it is a good option for other applications. I, I mean, I, I may be biased um, as one of the co-designers, but I think that hash is going to um, last a few more years yet um, before we have alternatives that will be suitable for all applications. So which hash? Uh, the bar, uh, oh, oh okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, Bo Hopwood. It, it feels weird to me to call it Bo, Bo Hopwood, but the name Fair people are using. Yeah, I guess for the ASH functions, there has been already uh, you know, motivation that we've seen in, in previous sessions uh, about, about standardizing those. Uh, how about the signatures? Can you say something about additional applications that you see there uh, that could be interesting? Where, uh, you know, verifying signatures in the SNARP can be useful. In, uh, I think another paper where they do this is uh, photo proof, where uh, Actually, I don't, I don't remember the details off the top of my head, uh, but I think this is something that's done there. Uh, so, so I can describe how it would be used in a, a scalable sapling-like protocol. The, the way we use signatures in sapling is so that we can offload um, the, the part of um, creating a spend proof that needs the secret key to a smaller device that can't itself do proving. So then when you want to verify that in a succinct blockchain, you need to verify that signature as well, because right? you don't want the, the final verifier to have to do that. I mean, it looks to me also that uh, identity systems may benefit of these, uh, you know, systems where you want to prove that you have data uh, signed by some trusted authority while not revealing the data. Yeah, I think there's plenty of justification for standardizing signatures. Oh, it's not friendly signatures. I think that, so the working group that was um, considering snark uh, friendly primitives, I think we'd, we settled on doing hashes and commitments first, but then the, the things to do after that were signatures, um, encryption, KDFs, PRFs. Yeah. Nerd. Um, Right, and, and another thing that um, perhaps uh, you know could be worth mentioning in terms of standardization from your work is whether it would make sense to standardize some uh, recursive technique, either fully full recursion or uh, you know, two layers uh, recursion. Uh, what do you think? I, um, you asking me or? I'm asking the first day orders, uh, and yeah, then anyone else who has an opinion. I mean, in terms of standardizing recursion specifically, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not clear to me exactly what would be standardized there or what there is to standardize outside of the curves that are used. Um, and the, I think the curves in particular, which ones you want to use, are going to vary depending on your application. 
uh, like we, we were just discussing about the difference between, uh, you know, like if you really want constant times square roots, maybe you want to look for something other than 377, uh, even though it's great for our application. Uh, but in terms of like the technique itself, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I guess it, it could be useful to have some kind of standardization for uh, PCDs and the sort of interface that they provide. Uh, I, I think it might be a little bit early for this. Um, not by long, but um, the, so, so there's a, a paper being uh, been published just very recently on um, so formalizing the technique that's used in Halo um, to create PCDs. Um, but we're still in the research phase for um, recursive protocols that are really practical. Um, I think maybe leave it a year or so. I would agree with that. Uh, and so, so the proof systems that you're using in recursion are the same proof systems that you can use outside recursion. So, so that aspect of the standardization um, is reusable. You, you don't necessarily need to, um, to standardize the recursion. You can leave that to application protocols. Yeah. Oh, is the interface provided by the sort of Halo based PCD any different from the fully? It's, well it's just standard PCD. Oh, yeah. So I guess oh, you were thinking about this in terms of uh, like standards. It, I mean, we basically have the same sort of interface here, but with two different instantiations. I'm, I mean, so. we could standardize the interface of PCD. Do people think that that's a worthwhile thing to do? Right, that would probably be the first step uh, needed. Yeah, I mean, as um, far as I know, that's pretty stable. So, okay, more questions. So there was a right that uh, discussion topic that uh, you brought up, um, which was about uh, whether it would make sense to standardize a formal model for the light client, for snark-based light clients in particular. Um, I mean, yeah, what's your opinion and the uh, I think personally, like maybe a note to add is that, um, you know, since we here we are in the context of zero knowledge proofs, probably there should be a motivation where, you know, privacy there should be there or where zero knowledge at least should be needed. Otherwise, this may start being out of scope, perhaps. What do you mm -hmm. think? I'm not sure okay. I agree with that just because the zero knowledge feature of it isn't used doesn't mean that it's not a zero knowledge proof technique that's being used. I, I mean, uh, even if it isn't strictly speaking zero knowledge, it's using the same primitives and it's it, it's using 90% of the effort of what we're standardizing. So I, I consider it to be completely within scope. Okay. But what about, how about this specifically the light client? Is there, I mean, maybe, I mean, the um, question that I, would help is, uh, is uh, whether there is, um, you know, something that could be useful even beyond that specific application. Yeah, so um, in our paper, we didn't present on this part as much, the formalization, but uh, in our paper, the formalization we tried to make as generalized as possible, but um, you can like sort of see how in a fairly straightforward way you could make ultralight clients for uh, most protocols or model sort of other um, existing ultralight clients through like the lens of our framework. Um, um, so while this formal model is here, I guess that's not something that's like 
I think we have we captured like a useful one, but not one that uh, like this sort of thing is not generally standardized. I guess it it seems um, too blockchain specific to me. So I think one uh, application that's actually a bit similar in structure is uh, what I was mentioning earlier, uh, photo proof, where you basically have an image and then you prove that some later image is um, an edit of it that has only used crops or rotations. So it's kind of similar in the sense that uh, you have some initial state and then you use snark proofs to update that to some later state that happens uh, you can think of it happening in an append only manner. Uh, so I think that's actually a bit similar to our application. It's also not clear to me exactly how common this, this sort of thing is. So more uh, questions or comments from the audience? Okay. So, so maybe just uh, Michael, just clarifying what you just said now. Um, you, when you say right, so in some sense, this uh, abstracting or formalizing the the, uh, the protocol would uh, allow for sort of generic uses of uh, in applications that have this append only method uh, for updating some state. Um, but then, would would you need in some sense, right? A kind of users to agree on that state and then there that's where kind of the consensus part of of the protocol comes in or or do you think that that's also something that can be kind of so taken out in, of in our model we just uh we only model consensus by uh assigning oracle that has the uh you know that signs as the validator set basically so, and we can just kind of parameterize this by any Oracle family. Makes sense. Thanks. Um, all right. Um, so, I don't know, if there are no more questions, we can also wrap up the discussion. So please remember that all the notes of the discussion are on the notes page. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in the topic, uh, you can join the working group. Uh, again, the working group, you can find it in the, uh, in the links uh, page under session five, there is a link working group. And so you know, the, cost, the discussion can continue there uh, and everybody is, uh, everyone is welcome to join. Daniel, you maybe, want to take over to conclude? Maybe, maybe we, I, don't know if, if, I don't know if uh, we did maybe extensively or not. I mean, do, do people maybe want to discuss a little bit uh, sort of what, what uh, uh, the scope of the working group would be in the end? I mean, I know we've discussed uh, the idea of, uh, of having the generalized uh, or formal protocol. There is right also the, the kind of the proving of, uh, of a signature verification, the recursive snark. Um, what is the scope, or at least let's put it this way, short-term scope of such a standard, right? I mean, uh, I think including everything would be definitely too much. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I know, I know Dara said that uh, recursive snarks may be a bit too early, uh, given the state That's of... Uh, just my opinion. You've yeah, yeah, I understand. Great. So, so, I mean, I mean maybe, maybe it is a place uh, where, where one could focus, right? Uh, so, uh, we have been uh, discussing BLS uh, verification also in the context of this other working group for primitives. Uh, maybe this can be kind of delegated for a little bit later when we advance on other primitives as well. But um, yeah, I, I mean, doing doing a pairing in a snark is actually quite complicated to do it efficiently. Um, lot, there are lots of techniques that you could use that are not in current uh, implementations. Um, 
Some of them documented on the Zcash wiki, by the way. Right. Um, so, I mean, I mean, if, if we could consider, I don't know, this is just a suggestion. Uh, if we could consider the protocol uh, itself as a, maybe as a way to demonstrate the use of recursion, um, or, or should it be, or should it be like the main standard and then recursion is sort of abstracted away or, I mean, what do people think is probably the best way to go? Again, this is based on the assumption, which is my assumption, it may be wrong, that uh, both things in one standard may, may be too much. So the, the thing about um, standardizing particular ways of doing recursion is that there are lots of different proof systems. Uh, you, so you, mm. you basically have a combinatorial problem where um, it, you're, I mean, if you assume that the that what your outer proof system uses is R1CS, then it's not too hard. But if you take into account all of the the other things, then it's, yeah, you've got an n squared problem at least. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of things that are like tractable and relatively stable. Uh, and doing signatures inside snarks is uh, probably more reasonable at this stage than yeah, because then you've only got a, a, a very small number of signature algorithms that are actually useful. Right. Well, I guess hash based signatures would also be useful. Um, I, I may be biased um, there as well as a co author of Sphinx. Okay. Anybody else have uh, an opinion on this? What what uh, would they like to see as as uh, the standard being? How how useful would they find such a standard? What kind of other applications or uses they would find for these? I mean, personally, I think the signatures and you know proofs on on signed data is um, it is generally enough and there should be enough motivation to include it in the standard. Sorry, I didn't hear the second thing you said there, proofs on what data? On signed data in general. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Um, I agree. I also think there's definitely use in having a standard for verifying signatures. Um, with recursion, I, I do agree that it, it seems a bit early, but even if there's many different options for how it can be achieved, I think there's a use in having a standard uh, just to show one possible way of doing it well, because it seems that recursion uh, enables quite a few pitfalls and just having a standard for this is one way you can do it. Uh, and if you're smart enough, you can do it better maybe it would also be useful. So what, if we did take that approach, what would we standardize? The original I don't know. And that's why I also think it's uh, probably still a bit early because I don't think there's uh, a, a clear choice to make there and uh, something that's clearly useful at the moment. Perhaps a good first stage would be to add uh, a survey of this to the community reference. Uh, the subsection uh, that discusses the various kinds of compositions, whether it's for um, a full-blown recursive composition or for limited depth composition, or just for uh, including specific elliptic curve functionality uh, rather than composing the ZK itself. Uh, we can uh, give some references to the uh, te techniques and papers, not make any choices, but at least outline the considerations and options. Hey, hey, that's a really good idea. I agree. Yeah, definitely. So um, we will have a dedicated session about the community reference. And one of the things that we'll be calling people for is what's missing and what can you help add? So if you care about composition, keep this in mind. Yeah.
Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll just echo again the words of Dario. And I mean, uh, if anybody else has other questions, please feel free to, or, or opinions, feel free to speak up. Uh, I don't think at this stage, uh, any opinion is noise because there are just too many opinions and it's uh, legitimate. Um, but uh, the working group, you know, I, I would encourage people to work, to join the working group, whoever is interested and, and really come up with a kind of charter that really scopes out the extent of, of at least the initial uh, version of the standard, right? Um, so, yeah. And uh, let's make sure not to duplicate too much work between working groups. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so I, I guess just to highlight it, uh, this, this probably would have uh, some overlap with the primitives working group. Um, but I don't think it would have uh, an overlap over other applications that we've seen because uh, sick, right, uh, recursion wasn't in any of them and uh, Right, an aggregation of signatures neither. So there's n there's no real commit and proof here anyway, either. I mean, it could be combined with commit and proof, but I don't think that, yeah, I don't think there's too much of an overlap. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> so thank you everyone. If anybody has la some last words before we part or we at least stop record stop the recording. Okay. So thank you again to the speakers. Uh, thank you to the moderators, Dario and Yupeng, Michael and Sai, all the authors of the paper. Uh, thank you to the note taker, um, Abida. Um, yeah, and see you all uh, next uh, next Thursday. I'm gonna stop recording now. <laughs>